Hello and welcome to Resident Advisors Exchange, a series of conversations with the artists, labels and promoters that are shaping the electronic music landscape. My name is Ryan Keeling and I'm the editor at Resident Advisor. Ask Tom Ellard about severed heads and he'll give you a look of exasperation. After hearing the story of the visionary Australian band, you'll understand why. Ellard is, by his own admission, the ringmaster of the circus that was severed heads, so he takes the successes and failures personally. And it's fair to say there have been probably more failures. Formed in Sydney's suburbs in the late 1970s, Severed Heads forged a long discography until 2008 when Allard decided to call it quits. It's fair to say that mainstream success came with their 1984 single, Dead Eyes Open. But as Allard says, it was all downhill from there. Severed Heads is the story of creative self-sabotage, of the refusal to settle for one sound or audience, and of experimentation that turned its nose up at trends. In anticipation of his return to the stage at Adelaide Festival in March, which you'll see him collaborate with Yu Schmidt, R.A. Sanjay Fernandez caught up with the Severed Heads ringmaster in his office at the College of Fine Arts in Sydney. When he nerved himself to return, the fire had done it for him. I guess we could start from the start uh, and you could tell us a little bit about how Severed Heads came about and in what year. Alright, okay, you've got to put yourself in the, 19, the late 1970s, which I know is very hard, um, but you have to primitive everything down a lot. <laughs> a lot. Uh, we are all at school and uh, we are making a racket. We are making a racket with tape recorders and synthesizers, drum machines, organs, all of the paraphernalia that we could get our hands on. At the time, this stuff was quite rare. And uh, for me to actually have a synthesizer was like having my own personal, you know, uh, Sputnik or something. It was, it was quite a, a miraculous thing. Um, we had a lot of tape recorders. Tape recorders were cheap and easy to get and you would put noises on them and they would loop around and we were doing this purely for our own happiness in life because that's what we wanted to do, that's what we wanted to hear. It wasn't for anyone else. And uh, part of that was calling ourselves Mr and Mrs No Smoking Sign because we figured that um, no one would treat us seriously if we called ourselves. And we didn't want to be treated seriously, we didn't want anything to do with anybody really. But people took an interest because apparently we were doing things that were rare, unusual and strange. And strangeness always attracts others. So who was part of uh, this kind of first incarnation of Seven Heads? Well, there was a fella called Andrew and there was a fella called Richard and they were already making noise. They were, they were making noise. And I joined in as a kindred spirit. Myself and Richard used to talk about what was going on musically at the time, which of course was seven inch singles. And uh, there were a lot of seven inches coming out in the late 70s, you know, 77, 78, which is the so-called post-punk period, because punk music had kind of done its dash by late 76. And I mean, it was still interesting, you know, it was still great to tell people to fuck off and die, but you couldn't just keep on doing the same four riffs over and over again. So people were experimenting. And Richard was buying a hell of a lot of these seven inches and he was writing about them to me and I was picking up on it. And Andrew was the first to leave because he, I think, really actually wanted to make music. <laughs> We weren't really helping. So we would make recordings on cassette and uh, they were strange and primitive and I still have most of them, surprisingly enough. So did you feel you were doing something new and experimental at the time? We were doing what we thought was necessary for our happiness. I think that's the best way of putting it. If you are filled with art, if you don't let it out, then it's like having a large meal, which <laughs> gives you a stomach ache. I, I 
needed at when I was 16 some people knock over gravestones other people um, cause violence and uh, I we had to make these sounds because they were the sounds that that were in our heads and we also were picking up on media radio and television and grabbing bits of television and cutting it up and throwing it back at itself and it was just simply an existence uh, a means of existence that's it how did you conceive the idea of working with tape? Where did you first come across the idea for this process? Well, you've got to, okay, at the moment, everybody in the universe has a computer or a phone or, or, or something like that. And so you look at your phone, which you've got because it's a phone, and you say, maybe I could make music with this. Or you get a computer, maybe I could make music with that. At the time, we're talking about dictaphones, uh, cassette recorders, uh, open reel tape machines were still around. If you were a hi-fi guy, you, 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 you know, you've got to remember there are no CDs, no digital recording at all. You would have a big open reel deck. And I could go into a hi-fi shop and I'd say, can I get a, a tape recorder? And they go, what, you mean like this, big open reel thing? Um, the whole experimentation that was going on around the world, people like Brian Eno, for example, with his tape delay systems he got from Robert Fripp and that, and tape loops, which had been in the avant-garde for, for a long time, Stockhausen and that, we, we basically heard about this. Um, but the main thing about it was that you needed some sticky tape and a bit of recording tape, and, and that was it. And then a toilet roll or something to, or you know, put a, a bit of sticky tape over the record head so that the sound would build up over and over again. These techniques were cheap and they were available to us. And... and it is almost impossible to think about these things except in a retrospective way at the moment and see this as somehow uh, uh, a texture. And it wasn't a texture, it was what was available. It was, you know, the whole post-analog, post-digital thing. It's just not an issue at that time. It was what was there. You talked about how this kind of starting point was a bunch of kids that felt the need to kind of get these sounds out of their heads and onto cassettes. In what year did it stop being about kids making, I guess, what you think? Well, we, 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 we um, made a bunch of recordings and we sent them to um, Double J Radio. At the time it was Double J, of course now it's Triple J. Double J, they, were, they used to have these specialist shows and there was a specialist show by, run by a fellow um, called Peter Doyle and he played one of our cassettes on air for about an hour. Of course you don't have that on ABC radio these days unless you're doing quite well and I thought to myself uh, we we are part of something. I don't quite know what that something is. It's some kind of scene and there were other people. There were the M squared bands uh, in Sydney. There was SPK. In Melbourne there was all the little bands and there were there was the the um, the industrial scene and all of that, Ollie Olsen and that. And we, we, we felt, well, you know, there's friends. We have friends, okay? Um, it's, there are people like us who think like us and we can be their friends and we don't have to be an island. It is not about being cool or being accepted. It was like, I have somebody to drink with now. <laughs> <coughs> what year did that tape get played in? On Double J. Uh, late, was it late 1979? And, and we cut an album in 1980 called Ear Bitten. We recorded it in 79 and, and then we went to EMI and we cut a record. And on the other side of the record was a band called the Rhythmics Chimpsk who were a free-form, uh, experiential, noise uh, conglomerate. And they did this kind of free-form stuff, and we did our own stuff, and we got pressed. We, we pay, co-paid for a record. The last time I saw one of these records, it was worth... Um, Oh, I don't know, two thousand five hundred bucks or something. We couldn't we couldn't sell them at the time. Um, but we were noise. We made noise. And and then why not why not send this record to record reviewers? Why not? And and we sent it to reviewers, and the reviewers were just disgusted by this thing. 
And we were making friends with people like SPK. And SPK were very organized. And they would play live and they would make records and they would they were they were in England and and, and, and so our friends were doing it and we would we would do it too and that was that was it really. I do want to get to SPK. Yeah. But just to dwell on that release, that ear bitten release. Yeah. That was released on Terse Tapes. Okay. Terse Tapes was a cassette label that I started in 1978 or thereabouts, although 79 was the only time that it actually appeared. And obviously cassettes were an enormously easy way of getting your music out. The record shops were surprised by them. You would walk in and you would say, I've got cassettes, and they'd go, what is this? And they go, look, 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 packaging, beautiful. Uh, and they would, they, we had a, for example, we had a cassette called Blubber Knife in 1982. We could not sell, we could not make enough of them. We, you know, the record shops loved us because we would make these sculptural things and we'd bring them in. Probably the best known terse tape was One Stop Shopping, which was a 1981 cassette compilation, three cassettes in a magazine that we made, which was a survey of all the crazy bastards in Australia that we could find at the time. So had all the Melbourne bands, all the Sydney bands, a couple of Adelaide guys, Wollongong. They were all on this thing, and it was like there were 62 bands on it, I think. And, and we would push this thing together uh, and take the shop, and we sold it for, ah, oh, was it like five bucks or something? I don't know. I can't remember exactly. And, and that made a real stir. I mean, Rolling Stone wrote about it, and the Financial Review wrote about it, and everyone was like, oh, cassette, 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 because obviously the kids were doing something. We need to know about this. It's like people writing about blogs or Twitter these days. All right, so we're making these cassettes, and we're putting them out, and of course everybody starts making cassettes, and the record shops are now being filled with all this dross coming in, and people just putting any crap that they could. So the whole thing dies enormously quickly. But the cassette thing was simply a matter of this was a great way of not having to go through EMI. And, you know, it's the same with, with burnable CDs later on. You didn't have to go through the record labels. That was what it was all about. And, 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 and the politics of it was just by the by. Um, obviously, it's a political act, but we didn't think about that. We just thought, we want to get all this shit out, you know. <laughs> that's, that's it. So, to come back to your question... We had a cassette label, cassettes die, and so we thought well, we better make records because after all records are the only way that we're going to lift ourselves above what the froth and bubble at this point. So I started a record label called the Dog Food Production System. What year was this? 1981. Same year as One Stop Shopping. You know, it was concurrent. We were aware of the fact that we needed to up the ante. We made four records before I lost all my money. The cardboard boxes in the bedroom, all the stories are true about making a record, it's always been true. And Clean by, by Severed Heads was the, the first one of the dog food records. Uh, by which stage? We're deep in the cold wave era now. What, what people now call cold wave or minimal synth. God help me, the Germans, minimal synth. So, so we'd gone from being this noise thing, experimental, and to being this minimal synth band. Can I just ask, at this stage, yeah. was the distribution and the audience kind of very intensely local, Sydney, Melbourne, or were you making kind of waves, not waves, but were you getting the attention of people overseas? It was mainly Sydney, Melbourne. It was inner city, inner city music of the at the time. Some of these things were being shipped over to England, and uh, there were a few real avid people in England and America who were picking up. You know, the sort of people who know everything the moment it touches ground. They were aware of it, but not not many people were i can't really answer because the the overseas people only announced themselves later when we were cool <laughs> yeah so so in in 83 for example when we were cool you had these people who would rock up and they would have a copy of ear bitten that they'd bought at rough trade records in, in london and they said that they bought it when that came out and uh, but we didn't know any of that so effectively at that stage no we tried distribution we tried distribution through um 
paid distributors. It was dreadful. It was absolutely shocking. And, and they, they would just basically rip us off. So we would, make, we would take the records and cassettes to the shops and do it that way. So let's get back to the uh, cold wave. Um, <laughs> cold wave. Um, you were taught, you, I guess you were kind of hinting at your disdain for the kind of shift into different genres or the different narratives that were being imposed on you. There are musical movements and they, they are meaningful. So the fact that in 1980 we were mainly using tape loops, by 1981... Clean was essentially sequences, because sequences. Okay, let's let's be clear. We had sequences because bands would sell them, and you get them at hawk shops. Everything we ever did was based around hawk shops. And what I love is reading about the electro guys, um, and the techno guys in in Detroit, and, and and that who who their music was based on the shit that they found in hawk shops. And I was thinking, isn't that great? Because that's how our music was defined. And so it's not surprising, I think, that we got into a very early sequence drum machine music, 81 or so, was based around the stuff that people were dumping. And so the album Clean, which if the joke is obvious there, why it's called Clean now, is that it's all sequenced and we've got a Roland SH-1 and a, and a 100 note sequencer and stuff. And it, it was dance electronic dance music. Now, of course, disco had been around for a while and you had bands around the place like, for example, Telex and Kraftwerk and that who were making this stuff. So it wasn't impossible for us to pick up on it. But um, obviously that kind of uh, lo-fi beat music that we were making is eventually what was going to turn into techno. Um, it wasn't at that stage, but it was going to be. So, so Cold Wave will do for the time being, I guess. At the same time, you again, this is applied retrospectively, but at the time, you just don't have any idea of what you're doing fitting in some kind of genealogy of music. Well, I you're guess. making the genealogy. I mean, you do shit, and then it would, it would suddenly would be... You open the door, and people go, Oh, there's been a door opened. And, and, and they sometimes confuse the, the importance of, of recording the opening of the door to actually opening the door in the first place, whatever. We were just doing what we were doing. Um, we made Clean. We kept on going. I made, uh, we made an album called Blubber Knife. At this stage, Gary Bradbury was a part of the, the team. So it's myself, Gary Bradbury, sometimes Simon Nucky would get involved. Um, we were playing live because Gary was was actually a friendly to he no he knew people he knew people around clubs he'd go up to people and say can we play live at your club and we would go like oh yeah sure okay so we would play live we would play live around Sydney we played one show in Melbourne God help us it was disastrous but anyway we played a show in Melbourne in eighty two by the time eighty three is starting to come around the place we were actually cool. And people would show up at our gigs with, with nice haircuts and designer jeans and stuff. We would play live and people would come to the shows. And, and 1983 was the time when I was still working on this kind of techno-y stuff. And, and I, I was pushing together stuff. In five minutes, I made a little piece of melody, which I called Dead Eyes Open. God help me. Disaster strikes from that point. It's downhill from <laughs> downhill from that point on. Um, we make an album called Since the Accident. Since the Accident was a combination of the tape loop stuff. It's still got lots of the tape loops and stuff going on, um, and this techno music that, that I'm learning how to make. And it had Dead Eyes opened on it. Okay, we are cool. And then a kind of magical artistic. Transformation takes place. A fellow, an English chap, comes down to Australia to visit Australia. His name is David Kitson, and he runs a record label called Red Flame. And Red Flame is looking for Australian bands because Australian bands are starting to become cool. You know, at this stage it was like the Saints, the Triffords, the Go Betweens. <coughs> All the jangly guitar bands that are coming out of Australia are becoming very cool in England. It's like Nick Cave was around that Nick time. Nick Cave was, yeah, he was on mute at that stage. Yeah, it was, it, Australia was flavour of the week at this point. It was starting to happen. So 
this guy comes down, the fellow from Red Flame comes down, he goes looking for stuff. And through a whole bunch of personal connections, and it's got to be said, it's by who you know, it's not, not, but we just happen to be at the right place at the right time. He gets a cassette of Since the Accident, because Since the Accident originally came out as a C60 cassette. 200 copies out there somewhere, God knows where they are, and I haven't got one. 200 copies of Since the Accident on cassette, and he picks one up, and the next thing we get a phone call. The silly bus has got on a train from Sydney to Melbourne <laughs> and he's got his garbage bag. I'm serious. He had one of those big green garbage bags full of demo tapes. And because he knew somebody who knew us and stuff, he picked up the first cassette off the top of that garbage bag, happened to be since the accident, and he'd listened to this stupid thing all the way on the train, 14 hours or whatever it is on the train down to Melbourne. By the time he got to Melbourne, he gives us a phone call and he says, I want to sign you to Red Flame. And we went, oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> oh, yeah, that sounds fun. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we we were on this red flame, and, and since the accident was pressed, actually, as a red flame, I've got one copy of this thing on red flame. Uh, and then he changed the name of the label to be Ink because he was starting again. He was getting away. The red flame was for the guitar bands. Ink was for the experimental, and you know, the cold wavy stuff. You mentioned you kind of these people were starting to come to your gigs. Obviously, yeah. we're getting attention uh, from David Kitson, was it? David Kitson, yeah. Um, can you just describe the setup you were taking to stage in these oh. performances and what what uh, what you were playing and how that was operating? Okay. You could not take all the gear that you you had because it it was enormously heavy. Uh, you had to leave some at home. So you had to have a, a van or a, or a station wagon. You fill up with all your junk, right? So you had television sets, big, big television sets, tape recorders, uh, keyboards. The keyboards were, you know, like medium so Heavy, heavy stuff. And you'd spend, like, all morning dragging the stuff in. So you get on stage, there would be an open reel tape recorder, which would have the backing tape on it. Okay, so you got backing tape with reels going around, and you'd have a, each person would have a number of keyboards because they weren't programmable. So you had these bits of cardboard or paper on uh, that you'd take on stage, and you would look at the picture, or if you were lucky, you had one with holes cut in it that you'd put over the top of the synthesizer, and you'd move the knobs to match the picture on the piece of cardboard, right? So when we were doing a piece, a piece, the, the tape recorder would start the beat because, you know, the beat was made out of tape, it was tape loops and stuff, so there was no point. One guy would have his keyboard set up right because he'd been doing it in the track beforehand, or you might have to take a few minutes in between songs or whatever. So he'd start off doing something. The other guy's got his set, and he's trying to move the, the, the to match the piece of, the piece of cardboard and of course, it would never match, so the sound would be all wrong. So you'd be spending your whole time moving things up and down, just trying to get it right. Uh, you might, I might have, for example, one of those portable cassette recorders. You know, little little guy, little dictaphone thing, and you could fast forward and rewind that, and 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 that would make sort of tape noises, which you'd then put one of those through one of those tape echoes, and that would, and or you could put it through guitar pedals. Guitar pedals were like were the, the really important thing. So you've got a lot of wires going everywhere and a lot of guitar pedals and a lot of keyboards and it never worked. <laughs> it never worked. It, never, it would just collapse gloriously. One time I remember Gary Bradbury and myself did a gig somewhere and we tried to do it all with sequences. It was at some community club or somewhere and we set all the synthesizers and stuff up as if it was our own studio. Taken, and we pushed the button and nothing happened. It was a complete disaster. Okay, so your, your chances of you getting your show to work were always desperate. And when you had a big show on, like when we were playing live somewhere, like we played this festival in 1983 and Kitson saw us play live, you know, and, and called Sedition. It was a Sedition Festival. The ABC recorded it. Um, there's all these sounds in there. You can hear me trying to tune stuff in, <laughs> make things work. And, 
And so anyway, yeah, how, how did you do it? It was very heavy, it was very bulky, it was very messy. And I have no idea why people continue to do it. So I'm getting the sense that these live um, performances were, a lot of it must have been improvised, um, trying to accommodate these kind of stuff up. So. No, we, we would rehearse. No, I, I mean, back when the tape recorded days, you know, back when we first started, it was improvised, which is rock in, is tape row, where we go. By 1982, 83, we had a set list and we would rehearse over and over and over again. But the mere fact that you would move a keyboard from the studio to a live place and the temperature was different, would put it out of tune. Or the patch that you were listening to in a bedroom somewhere when you heard it through a PA was completely different. And 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 it improvisation. We we hated the improvisation. No, I, I I'm not I'm not. We'd done that. We'd been there. And we you know once you'd done something, there was no need to keep on reiterating. And people who kept on improvising because that was a style, they weren't really interested in that. We were trying to be tight. <laughs> we were really, we were really untight, but we were trying to be tight, and we were playing dance music. We were playing, we you know, there would be weird shit, but there would also be stuff like Dead Eyes. We would play it live, and I would play. I I know that bass. I know that bass line off, but I can do it in my sleep because I've played that song live so many times. And people would respond to that. Oh fuck yeah! Oh yeah, they knew. They knew the stuff. They knew the stuff. Uh, they didn't know all of it, and we'd try and fool them, but we knew that. I mean, a few times we'd play live, and we'd get Dead Eyes open, and we'd play it high, fast forward on the on tape recorder, so just make this noise that would be over in, in 30 seconds, and we'd go on there. But you couldn't win that. You couldn't win that game. And you mentioned you used to cart te televisions to your gigs yeah. as well. So the visuals seem to be a very important part of... We met up with Stephen Jones. Stephen Jones, who was the video synthesizer member for a while there, he came to our very first gig in 1980. Uh, he, he was interested in lots of stuff. 83. 83? God, 82. 82. Late 82. I, I might get there. And late 82, they put on over... Directly visible from where we're talking is is, is a Metro Television, a community television station. And he was demonstrating this video synthesizer he built for a thing called Future Screen. And he needed a band to come in and play. And he, he, he said, we rang up, he said, look, I've got this video synthesizer. Would you like to play live while we demonstrate this thing? And so we've got this uh, series of videos called Live at Metro Screen, which would the first time we'd worked together. Um, and then he kind of got involved semi at this stage, and so we wanted to show the, the video that we made, or we might want to do some live videos. I mean, of course, you, the, <laughs> there was no video projectors to be had. There, that wasn't possible. So he took this big family television set with the wood grain down over 26 inch, and you might want two of them. And, and, and so you'd get the elevator, one guy at one end of the television, and we were like a removalist truck. And we'd, you'd put it up, and you put it on a screen, and then the first two rows of people could see it. <laughs> but it was, uh, we were making an effort to, to get the video synthesizer thing happening at that stage. I also want to get a sense of a scene in Sydney at the time. Mm -hmm. um, you were obviously you were playing gigs. I yeah. want to know what kind of gigs you were going to see or what kind of... Um, if any, or well, there were a lot of there was a lot of underground venues. There were a lot of lounge rooms. There were a lot of community halls. There were a lot of squats. Um, obviously, there were bands coming in from overseas playing at normal venues. Okay, so I might see bands come in, rock bands like Magazine and XTC, and you know you get drunk and bounce around. You know whatever normal stuff. So don't don't discount that still going on but the main thing what would happen is somebody would say we're going to have a party at such and such a squat would you set up and we'd go yeah okay or we'd put on a gig at a community hall m squared were very active in in finding venues so they were a record label they were more organized so mitchell jones and co they would find uh for example again view out the window here is uh, the paddington rsl they had a a, a gig going there for every week for a while because the pubs used to put bands on 
And so you would, uh, we would be doing gigs at that time at pubs here, there, and everywhere. I get beaten up and thrown out a lot of the time. But you would go to a pub and you would see people that you vaguely knew play live. Okay, that was the honest answer. Is like, you know, oh, Jim's band is playing at such and such a pub on Friday. Right, I'm there. Um, it was very much a community bonding. We are the only people interested in this kind of exercise because, quite frankly, we were the only people interested in, in this. Um so I don't think it's all that different to Melbourne. Melbourne was the same kind of deal. There was community centres and there were pubs and there were clubs. And when we say club, we just mean a pub that happened to have a club running on a certain night, you know, or a mirror ball in, in, in the men's lounge or some shit, you know. So, no, we, we, we would, it was very low level. But at the time, of course, it seemed monstrously profound. And, and oh, we had, we had 100 people show up. <laughs> Yeah, you know, um, the the people who were different, of course, were SPK. SPK put on a gig at the Brickworks, which is now a park, but back then it was an old kiln. It was a kiln that they seriously, where they would make bricks, and they broke in, and they set up PA, and they 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 put on who was on with them. I don't know. I was behind the PA. Uh, there were lots of goats' heads eaten and industrial sounds being made and, and all of that, you know. Do you look at that, do you remember that fondly, those sorts of performances oh. by SBK? Or, I mean, I, I feel that they fit in... What, did they see themselves as an industrial outfit? Oh, yeah, they were, they were serious. They were very serious people. I mean, we were friendly with them. They were um, older than us. You know, I can't, I can't exactly figure out, maybe 10 years older than that. So they were university educated and they were uh, cool and then were on, on industrial records. So obviously they were industrial, if you're on industrial records. Uh, and, but they, I mean, we had a very strong personal relationship with them. Um, we're coming down to SPK, uh, that, that we knew them and they knew us and there were very few people that were interested in any of this stuff. So you had to be a tribe, you had to be. But at the same time, they really couldn't figure out. Um, they couldn't figure us out. They just thought we were a bunch of crazy kids and, and, and you know. But I mean, I've seen, again, I've never seen Severed Heads perform. I've never yeah. seen SPK perform. I've yeah. only seen footage. Yeah. And I mean... You performed, you performed with SPK. One time in a nightclub, yeah, yeah. And, but I mean, I saw, I see footage of SPK playing and they're banging corrugated iron mm -hmm. and they're playing power drills. Mm -hmm. And I, I imagine that's something that might have appealed or been on a kind of similar tip to what Severed Heads were doing in terms of experimentation uh, nah. with live performance. No, <laughs> there was no, okay. Um... There is a certain spirit, there is a certain kindred spirit which is expressed in different ways. Uh, I am perfectly able to get along with rock bands and, and metal bashers and, and anyone who has that kind of kindred spirit. And SPK were all about sparks and fireworks and, and, and big monumental kind of crowd-pleasing kind of activity. We were nerds. Nerds hadn't been invented by that stage, but we had the little boxes everywhere. We were much more uh, the people who made the horrible noises without actually being able to tell how we were making a horrible noise. Um, SBK and ourselves had a very, uh, we had a, uh, uh, it, look, look, it was a question of survival and it was a question of all being on the same life raft. The fact that they were using the life raft in a different way to us didn't really matter. But we were, we were friendly. And of course, when SBK turned around and became a pop band, uh, it was like, well, duh. <laughs> it was giving us shit because we turned into a pop band. And it was like, well, yeah, of course you will. I mean, you will one day. I mean, because it's the only effective way of, of connecting with people. And that's why you're doing this. So get on with it, you know. And you... We're not attempting to connect with people in that same way, or no. We, we, we wanted we had friends. We the, very early on we it was a tribal thing, but tribes are 
are only momentary. The solution for 1981 was not the solution for 1983. It could not be. And, and people who get upset that their music doesn't stay the same, what do they want, a refrigerator? So you get picked up or you get noticed by... Uh, Ink. Ink. Yeah. Um, does this coincide with the kind of first international tour that you do in 1986? Well, not, well, not there yet, not there yet, not there yet. Let me, uh, very briefly, Ink picks us up. Now, Red Flame picks us up. Red Flame becomes Ink. Ink is absorbed by Virgin Music. We're now on Virgin. We went from being on this little label run by this guy with a garbage bag full of cassettes. Now we're on Virgin Records. And, and, and Virgin Australia. Hi! Ah, let's have a ferry cruise. What? Let's have a ferry cruise to launch your album. It's like, and the rest of the band at that stage going, oh, yeah, 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 let's have a ferry cruise. I'm going, guys, guys, advances, major record labels, death, major problems don't 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 do. i remember the publicity guy from virgin wore a white boiler suit all the time <laughs> it was hilarious anyway so so virgin australia picks us up and so we're on virgin record and i tell everyone i used to go to high school with hey everybody i'm a virgin they go you're full of shit i go no 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 I'm a, you're full of shit man you know okay, okay fine whatever i was thinking well okay well you know so we cut the record we cut the record in australia uh, on virgin on the, on the on the virgin and 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 i don't know what possessed us at the time but I, I we put a lock groove at the front of the record front of the record yeah yeah we put a we put a lock groove at the front so when you put the needle down it gets stuck the moment you start playing <laughs> the, guy, the guy at cbs cutting he goes you sure you want? Oh yeah, yeah, this is great. Yeah, no one else done this before, so we we put it down. Of course, Virgin, just just it's just like that's the beginning and the end of it, right there. Just just instantaneously, they we are not what they're looking for. Virgin Germany sticks it out, and in England it comes out through Ink, distributed by Virgin. Now all of a sudden we're mainstream because Bloody Dead Eyes Open, of course, is now on Virgin. And Virgin's shopping it to all the nightclubs here. And it's like, ooh, 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 seven heads, ooh, 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 ooh. It's like, you know, we were out selling, um, what was their name? Um, Scritti Politti with wood bees and all that stuff. So all that sort of main LA kind of schmooze stuff. We were, we were the, we were underground techno music. Boom. It was, it. And, and what, what is this new sound made with cheap shit brought from, from junkyards? Oh, we, we want more of that. Ink flies us out in 1985 to England, and that is where we play live for the first time. They're all there, all the haircuts are there, all the groovers are there, all the sunglasses are there, all the all the hoi polly, they're all lined up, and we play the same track for 30 minutes. We play a trance track called Cato Gets the Girl. And I mean I mean like like fucking, you know, I'm talking like slow dubby kind of like, you know, woo ba woo ba stuff for thirty minutes. And they're just standing there like, what is this? What the hell is this? You know? It was like like all these people are packed to come and see this thing. And it was like what and that, and so we do that, we do that for thirty minutes and then we play a track called Goodbye Tonsils, right? For, which goes for nine minutes and it's just this turns into this huge wall of noise and then we walk off and it's just like and the record label <laughs> record labels like oh well, well done chaps uh and 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 the, every magazine would just kind of like you know we have no idea what these people are on about we have no idea so it was kind of mm, the beginning of, of our decline from from being uh, the flavor of the month, which but, is good. <laughs> yeah, good, right. So that's, I mean, I, I wanted to ask you how you felt about this kind of virgin kind of mainstream success and then, I guess, in t almost intentionally kind of turning your nose up at, at that and, and feeling that it wasn't the right way forward for you. In retrospect, I admit that our constant sabotage of everything we've done is neurotic. At the time, though, 
it was a proper acknowledgement of the fact that the band was always a bunch of kids making a racket. And the fact that the bunch of kids making a racket was now being taken seriously by all of these guys wearing white boiler suits uh, was something that needed to be brought back to reality constantly. Now, of course, I, I, I now think we didn't really like ourselves very much, but we had a lot of fun. <laughs> Um, so we made, I mean, I mean, Kato gets the girl, the thing that we played, we made that into a 12 inch single later on an ink and it's, it's, it's only, tw it's been cut down. So that's 22 minutes long, but it's this 22 minute long, um, kind of ambient, uh, experimental 12 inch that ink we're like, okay, yeah, fine, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, I also saw that. Kato Gets the Girl was released on VHS. Yeah, well, that, that was it. We made a VHS of the thing that we did at the ICA. Later on, in 85 or so, he put out a VHS. I mean, it was trying all these things with us. Sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. Inc. would put out 12 inches of ours, and, and you know, they would always just get this. I mean, my... we. My favourite, I don't, the word is not quite right, but my favourite review of, of Goodbye Tonsils was by the NME writer Julie Birchall, who says, the one liner sounds like the title of a Stephen King novel. Full stop. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah? <laughs> so. So no, we, we never, we never, we never, but looking at the people who were cool, who were cool at the time the people the bands that were picked up and, and lionized at the time they all disappeared they all they all got who are we up. talking about oh you know well i don't <coughs> i don't like to name names really but spk for example because they've already been brought up they do metal dance and you know it's on a on a Eng small english record label and and they do it and it's hugely successful and then some American label picks them up and then they die. And uh, it's all just whoop, woo. And, and if it's going to be that, then you may as well do it on your own terms, I think. Sure. Um, I guess I'd love to jump forward. Oh, yeah. Um, I guess. I mean, I found your disc... I find your discography is so long. Yes. Um, and hard to... I found it very hard to negotiate. Okay, it's like a, it's like when you're testing out a DJ record, you drop the needle, drop the needle through it. Okay, I don't mind. Drop yeah. the needle. I mean, like, is that how you approached it? I mean, is, was it very? Were these re releases that you were doing in this time very kind of disposable for you, or was it? Were it oh no, no, a lot of you would work for eighteen months on these things, or, you know, twelve months or whatever. There is a lot of stuff, but there's a lot of time it took. I mean, most bands just don't last this long. Can I try and sum it up and then you can, uh, you know, we go on Virgin and then we get dropped fairly quickly and then we're in England in 85 and the Canadians arrive. Hello, we're Canadians. We've got all our own teeth and, you know, scrubbed up. They were a record label called Network and Network were um, looking for a label to sell Skinny Puppy to. And Inc., wasn't interested in Skinny Puppy, but they were interested in another Canadian band called Mauve. In ex an example, in exchange for Mauve, Network picked up Severed Heads. And this is the beginning of the so-called industrial dance music or electric body mu music, EBM thing going on in, in the west coast of America. So Severed Heads fly over. To, to Canada and we signed to Network and of course Network was the cool label at the time and up up we go again Skinny Puppy and Severed Heads. Um, we do an album called Come Visit the Big Bigot. Come Visit the Big Bigot was released by Inc and Volition and Network all at the same time. We had three independent record labels doing this thing all. So the publicity and everything was really big and it was we toured America Canada, America, Europe with this thing. And so this is the era, era that most people know us for. And I still get people saying, oh, do you still know the skinny puppy guys? 
And I go, uh, that's like 20 something years ago. Uh, no, I don't know these people anymore. Um, but we became one of the, um, again, another genre, this electric body music thing. And Front 242 and, and, and all of these all of these things started picking up in the scene. So here we are in the middle of yet another scene, completely not really having anything to do with it. I did mention another label, Volition, that had started in Australia in at the time. Volition in 1985 started doing electronic and dance music in Australia. It was a independent label that was trying to do this here, and we were part of that as well. And that was the status quo for a good number of years from that point on. Right. I mean, I guess the network released like Rotund for... Rotund for success, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, so obviously there was this kind of... um, You felt at home, not at home, but you felt comfortable releasing. Your experience with network was good or within this scene it was kind of... It started off good. Our relationship with network was we were small, they were small, we grew together so big bigot did quite well big bigot was was a a a seminal record in electronic music uh and then we had um we did a bad mood guy which all fell apart because i i was having trouble getting people to understand what that was about and they weren't all that interested so we we had a bit of misstep with that one and then rotan for success had a track on it called Greater Reward. Now, Greater Reward was, the, the big guns all came out for that, recorded EMI and produced by Robert Rasick, and there was like, it was picked up, and it was, and I have been told, I've seen paperwork, it was the biggest selling import 12 inch in America at the time. It was like, it was really big. It was like, you know, so you know, import 12 inches, everyone's, oh, I want to import 12 inches. So at the time in, in 1988, it was, it was like every, every American DJ, oh yeah, that was, that was, that was top shit. Problem was, at one time we actually got an American pressing of it, the, the buzz had died on it. It's DJ culture, it lasts a month, you know, whatever. But we, we were sitting pretty at that point. But the problem was everyone was getting a little bit kind of normal by that stage. You've got to have three hit singles on each album and EMI wanted this and CBS wanted that. And uh, we couldn't, you know, like Greater Award did well and then we would, they wanted another one and they want another one and they want another one. And that kept on going for a while, and that was the history for us a little bit. And that, of course, it was the to jump a fair distance. It was the reissue of Dead Eyes Open that was, was top twenty here, and it was only top twenty because every state in Australia was into it, apart from friggin' Victoria and Melbourne, which hated it. <laughs> so he got, it was like, oh, number eight, number seven, and then Victoria forty or something. <laughs> You know, I don't know, we weren't cool in Melbourne at the time. In any case, we do that thing, 1994, I'm not interested in this shit. I didn't even, I, I supply the parts, Robert Race it puts it together, it does big guns all around the place, and I have no interest or connection with this thing at all. I, I'm, at this point, something's gone terribly wrong. Uh, it's top 20. Oh, I don't know. It was like, yeah, 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 whatever. Yeah. Nothing else was of any interest at this point. This is probably what happens with everybody. You grow up with people and then suddenly they're wearing business suits and you're not. So how do you deal with this then? Well, if you're organized, you, you, you move into a different realm. If you're disorganized, you just allow everything to collapse, which is what happened. 1995, volition collapses into a big heap. 1994 uh, or thereabouts, uh, networks stop actually dealing with this. We would hand in a demo tape and they would just go, mm, yes, and they'd have another demo and they'd go, mm, yes, and that would just keep on happening. Who's in, involved in the project at this time? At Very much me at this time, with Robert Racic doing production and other people coming along and, and, and 
helping out. But yeah, it, it's a stage where the equipment allowed you to basically multi-track. Hey, multi-track, woo! Um, and, and, and keyboards that you would turn them off, and when you turn them back on, they, they still have the thing in them that you... That you You'd used, I mean, in 1994, around this time, I think you started using MIDI? Yeah. No, no earlier, way back, 1986. You had started using MIDI? Yeah. In 86. Yeah, 85, actually. 85. What was it? We, okay, I, like, I, I tell people these things and they're surprised. Um, we, I had a TB303 in... In, in 1983 and, and this guy rang me from England and he says oh you, you know like you is this no 81 no 81 was it yeah it was 81 Christ I get confused these days um or thereabout I can't remember exactly but he says oh you were like yeah oh yeah I was making dance music with this TB303 and he's kind of like well uh, because no one else was at that stage a MIDI, this, this thing came out called the Gelling House Music System God help me what a piece of shit that thing was the first MIDI interface that you could get that would come off a Commodore 64 computer. And, and it really didn't work very well at all. Took it back to the shop and they gave me a thing called a Card32, which was the first MIDI interface that the Commodore 64, you, you could sequence of 16 tracks of MIDI. Woo. Um, so we were doing that real early on, you know, we were doing all this shit early on. But MIDI back then was pretty bad. It was like, you know, having one of those little wind-up uh, music boxes. So there wasn't much you could do with it. Um, still, it meant that you could start doing interesting things with, with complicated keyboards and stuff, over, overdub and stuff. By the early 1990s, 1994, uh, was the did an album called Gigapus, and the interesting thing about Gigapus, well, a number of interesting things about Gigapus, but the thing that's relevant here is it was all done on samplers. There was no tape recorder, okay. So all the tracks were like everything was going into a sampler, and it was being played back live from a, a sequence that was playing back all the vocals, all the parts, all the, 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 the synthesizers were live, all of that was going straight onto DAT. So it was a completely digital recording in 94, and that was kind of good and bad, because the sampler had two megabyte of memory. <laughs> so all the vocal lines had to be very, very curt, very curt to fit two meg, you see. Did that suit your personality? You didn't... No, it was just what just was. Well, the, 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 the tape recorder broke down, didn't it? <laughs> I just thought maybe you cut words. Maybe you were. Oh, look, uh, <laughs> we, we'd used it. We'd used a sixteen-track tape recorder to do the album before, which was, you know, um, I don't remember now. Um, we'd got that from a junkyard anyway. So it was real, real by that stage, and it was like, ah, oh, no good. Um, so the sampler was the only way of doing it. See, I mean, you had drum machine and, the, and a bunch of keyboard, rack of keyboards, right? They were playing all the melodies and stuff, but all the vocals and anything that wasn't a synthesizer would come off the sampler, and that was, that was how it was done. So you were playing gigs around this time as well? Yeah. And you'd take the, all that stuff... No, no, no. We, we, we. By that stage, you could have a, a a DAT machine that had like a time code on it, and time code could run a sequencer and where you go. It was all very MIDI at that stage. I, I mean, I'm getting the sense now, um, just given the the timeline we've talked about. Yeah. Um, that severed heads is just this kind. It has been this kind of floating. Joke. <laughs> I wasn't going to say joke. Yeah, we are. But, but it's just, it hasn't, it never intended to plant itself or no. root itself in no. some scene or some. No. It's the other uh, term. Uh, no. Uh, Seven Heads just is this thing that rolls along and it, 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 people keep on identifying as, oh, it's an industrial band. Well, not not really. Oh, it's a techno band. Well, no, not really. Oh, it's it's avant garde. Oh, it's sound art. It's it's a folk band. It's whatever I happen to be into this year band. And we're just just we're always just ourselves. 
and we didn't care. I mean, at one point, you know, the, the time where things went bad was when I actually took the music industry seriously. And I started thinking about, you know, release schedules and shit. I was an idiot. You know, that, well, that, that fucked everything up, you know. And, but, but the whole thing died by 1998. It was all dead. It was absolutely and totally dead. I had 50 bucks in the bank and no one would, would talk to me. Is this the time that kind of you decided to take Severed Heads and the Archive online as a kind of a, a reaction or, or a way to kind of well deal with that, um, that well, event of falling apart or no one talking to you? Well, it happened anyway. Um, <laughs> um, the, the, in 1992, we had a bulletin board system. Which meant you actually had to you, your computer had to ring my computer up on the phone, which meant there weren't too many overseas people. But we we had people who would get all their messages and they would phone from England or America, and that. you could do it. That it was called FidoNet, and I ran a FidoNet bulletin board called Twister. And then Twister got linked up to the very early internet. At that stage, it was called the ARPANET, and then this internet thing started up. And this label this this. Uh, publisher called Next Next Publishing, who would do Rolling Stone magazine, decided they were going to get into the internet, and so they started this thing called Next Online. And they said, "Would you like to put your music online?" That was like 1995 or something like that. So, oh yeah, okay, yes. Yeah, so, so we had Dead Eyes Open, of course, was online in 1995, and the, the 10,000 people, something on the internet at that stage, could download it over two hours or something. And and we were online from the very beginning. So this guy rings me up. Uh, one of the guys on this um, FidoNet thing. This guy kind of he didn't ring me up. He get on the he does it on the typing called Stephen Jones. Now that confuses people. So we talk about Stephen Jones the Elder or Stephen Jones the Younger. This one's Stephen Jones the Younger. Stephen Jones the Younger is in Texas and he says he would like to set up this website for me. I go, oh yeah, okay. So he starts up sevcom.com. Actually it was supposed to be sev.com but sev.com was already taken. So he, we called it sevcom.com. Anyway, whatever. So we were up and running, and, and I can't exactly figure it out because the records don't go that f get back that far. I think it was up and running in 90, late 1995, but I think we registered in 94. I can't remember. We were like out way before Google. <laughs> we, were, we were online before Google had even been thought of. They hadn't even gone to uni at that stage. So we're up and we're doing our web thing. And, of course, all this other shit's breaking down. The record labels breaking down everything, and we figured out in 1998, hey, we can get blank CDs. Because in 1994, when I cut my, cut, cut my first blank CD, the blank cost 80 bucks. To get it cut, cost 300 dollars. Yeah. By 1998, the blanks were down to 20 something bucks each. Serious, and the CD burner was two thousand one hundred bucks. So three of us went thirds, and and seven hundred bucks each. We bought a CD burner, and then the blanks went down to thirteen bucks, which meant that I could buy a blank for thirteen bucks and sell it in America for twenty. And so we set it up. We set up a CD label. Problem was selling them because there was no PayPal, there was nothing like that. So people would have to fax their order and then we had to get a little credit card thing and go <laughs> with a credit card. So, so you would get people would fax their order to us and we'd do a credit card thing and then I would burn a CD um, at 13 bucks and then we'd make 20 bucks on it which would cover 4 bucks postage and that was how we did it. And how successful was this method of distribution? Well, we're an EMI. <laughs> we, 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 okay. The, we had in 1988, I had, uh, 1998, pardon me, I get confused. Something. I, I had an album called Hall Ass. And Hall Ass was entirely done by this method. Okay, so Hall Ass was, 
was recorded on um, the equipment I still had after selling most of it to eat, uh, cut on the burner, put into the envelope, sent out, and we did in that first period a thousand of them um, pretty quickly. Now, a thousand copies is small in terms of what we're doing through major labels, but God, that's a lot of burns <laughs> and a lot of and a lot of on a lot of of of, of um, postage bags and going to the so yeah it, it I think it's done about three thousand or so since then so it was it, we I, there there was every time a new release would come out there's a there's a thing called a number one mail bag I know them very well you can get into it you can actually get I got into one to put, get a photograph taken as a publicity thing on the website at one stage you know. So there's just my feet sticking out the top of this number one mailbag. And we would fill those, when a new release would come out, we'd fill one of those for a while. We would be sending out number one. So so it was nothing that the tax department has to worry about in terms of income, right? Because by the time you'd worked it all out, you were, you know, gaining a little bit, losing a little bit. It was all, but the stuff was going out. And we were way ahead of, of everyone who was doing this stuff, you know, like... It's great when they invented PayPal. It was <laughs> saved a lot of trouble. So, what was Sevcom's purpose, I guess, in in, in all of this? For talk, uh, we used to make these booklets that we'd mail out to people called uh, the the Sevcom book. No, what were they called? Uh, oh, there was a big bigot booklet, and there was a rotund booklet. There was these booklets, that, and you, you get them printed up and mail them out, and it cost a lot of money. So the website was one of those books. It had lots of how do you do this, how do you do that, and a, and a discussion forum. And and we our first internet discussion forum ran for 13 years. Had all kinds of people on it from all over the place that, that are better known now. Um, 20 years we ran it all up because the first one shut down and then we started up at number one and so on and so forth. So it was, it was friends. It was a friendship thing. It was like, hey, there are other people we can make friends with and they're international now. And that's what Sevcom was about. Okay. And then, I mean, where did it go from there? Like, I mean, this, this Severed Heads project, you've gone, you're at the, I guess, towards what you might think is the tail end of the kind of Severed mm. Heads project. Yeah. You've got an archive now online where what, do you go from there? What happens next? Okay, I can I can pick a fulcrum moment. Okay, now by ninety no by two thousand and three or four, where are we at? The glitch thing's going on big time now. It's post digital glitch, cut up, uh, glitch dub. It's all Germany again. America's fallen out of the loop. Thank Christ because they had no fucking idea what they were doing. No one gives a shit about network anymore. We're all now in Germany again, yeah! So so it's all basic, basic channel and, 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 and chain reaction and all those guys. So that's the stuff I'm... And I'm doing mouse on Mars, uh, that, that, that thing. And we're all happening in that realm. But I'm working full time, I'm in advertising, I'm, I'm, I've got a, I have to get a job, I've got a real job. And I'm thinking, you know, like, I'm sending these records out, but it's not really a big thing. In 2003, thereabouts, we would play live at the Big Day Out every year. We, every year, Severed Heads would play. Uh, we'd do a couple other things, but essentially it was kind of winding down. It was like, you know, I've been doing this for a hell of a long time now. It's time. I'm an old man, you know. It's like, so, so I say, I'm not going to have anything to do with anything. anything. And then... In 2004, a friend of mine called Creve Stenders is making a film called The Illustrated Family Doctor. And he says, would you like to do the film soundtrack for this? Thing? I'd love to do that. I've done a film soundtrack before. So, yeah, I'd, I'd love. To. And he says, oh, I need all these air conditioners and Muzak. And then I, I said, I've just been doing this music, which is all Muzak and air conditioners. So we had a wonderful time putting this thing together. And he said, we'll have to do a soundtrack album for this thing. And, and I'm like, OK, well, I'm, who needs a soundtrack album when the film's on DVD? I mean, well, why don't we do a, a, a soundtrack album? We'll make a soundtrack album and then we'll make videos. 
to go with a soundtrack album. What year was this, sorry? 2004. Right. So we made all, I made the soundtrack CD, which is all the bits in the film, and then we went out and we made videos to go with the music that was on the soundtrack album, to make it a DVD-CD combo. And it was, went out through inertia. And it won the ARIA. And so I'm at the ARIA Awards. They this say, is the Australian Music Awards. Australian Awards, Music Awards yeah. So, um, so they say, come down to, to the Conservatorium of Music. Oh, that sounds good. You've got to wear a suit. Yeah, okay, fine. And do a gig. Oh, okay, right. So I get up and I do a, a, a video. They've got video projector and everything. I'm doing a gig. And Not I, TVs? Didn't take your TVs to the... No, I had projectors by then. They, they actually had a projector set up at the Conservatory. It was all very swish. And I, I knew from, the, from, from experience or what I knew of Arias that if you actually performed at the Arias, that was because you weren't going to get one. Right, that's the old conundrum. So they say, come play at the, the fine arts arias with the soundtrack and stuff. I go, um, yeah, I, of course I get to wear a suit and play a laptop at the Conservatorium of Music. Who wouldn't do that? And then they say the winner for the best soundtrack album of 2005 is Severed Heads. And I'm walking off stage to trip out and I'm going, ah. Uh, I'm seriously like, like, okay. You have defined yourself as outside of the music industry. You think no one gives a flying fuck whether you live or die. You've become very comfortable with that. And then you're on stage wearing a suit at the Conservatorium of Music and somebody just announces that you've won one of those pointy things. And that fucked my head up. In public, big time. I wandered off stage, fell over in the orchestra pit, got back on, picked this thing up, had my photograph taken, and then, then, then just sort of didn't know what to do with myself. Because you were ready to shut down everything, and then you get given this industry award. So it all started up again. How? <laughs> uh, well, I, I'll do this, do that, play live, put this out, you know, start up again. I mean, you like you supported Gary Newman when you came. Oh, hang on. Well, we're jumping a fair. We're jumping a fair bit there. We're jumping a fair bit because let's jump again. Thirty years. It's impossible to, to do the continuity here. In two thousand and eight, I had gone back to university. Look, university. I got to get a job. I'm not in advertising anymore. I'm not doing my advertising job anymore. I got to do something. I gotta eat, so what I'll do is I'll work at a university. So I work my way up through the academic pile. Um, and I had to do a thesis work for, for I had to for part of my I had to put a thesis together. So what I did was I did this this um, suitcase which had every different kind of recording medium in it. So you open it up and there's a record and an eight track cartridge and uh, you know uh, uh, every all these different things and I had the same piece of music which I've composed on to each one of these things it was an academic thing so I've got this eight track uh, cartridge recorder and to make the cartridges and I, I posted about that on the severed heads mailing list all of this thing and then I realized something which had been true for a very long time that all the responses I were getting back were just people being trolls and shitheads and that really rubbed into me the point that the friends that we had built up, the friends that we had in 2002 or 1992 or whatever, the, the people around us had moved on or had disappeared or, or done something else. It's the end of 2008 and I just thought, that's it. Fuck it. I put this picture of myself going, you know, giving the finger, posted it on this thing. Shut it all down. It was great. Game over. Finish. Walk away from the wreckage. I'm happy again now, okay? It stopped. 2009. Hey, I can just be this new thing now. The phone call. Hi. My name's Sarah. I work at a label called Modular Records. And we'd like to talk to you. And then it starts up again, because Modular were putting a thing on for the Sydney Festival 2010. Sarah was organising a thing about what was going on in 79. 
It was called Circus 79. Would you play live at the Sydney Festival? Okay. Friend of mine gets on the phone. One of the few people who, you know, I said like in, in 95 and it was all over, 96 and we were dead. One of the few people who picked up the phone back then said, would you like to play live? We've got Gary Newman coming out. Would you like to do it one more time for shits and giggles? We'll get you really nice hotel rooms. I go, oh, yeah, okay, yeah, that sounds right. I'll do it one more time for that. Adelaide gets on the phone. Would you like to play live? And I say, no, we're not playing live. This is, so can you, you're playing, you're actually playing Adelaide Festival. This is, this is the punchline. I'll, this will, will happen. We will not play Adelaide. Not only are we not playing Adelaide, but we swore, and this is true, we swore to Gary Newman we would play li- never play live again. Anecdote. We're backstage. It's time for us to never play live again. We're finished. That's it. So we go up and we tell Gary Newman and crew that we're never playing live again, and we sign this document. <laughs> In front of Gary Newman. And he signs it too. We say, we're never playing live again. And we said, right, that's it. You can't, you can't do it now. You can't play live again. So that's it. Well, I'm happy now. You know. And anyway, so Adelaide, would you play live? No, no, we're not playing live. No, no, no. I'll do a computer game. I'll do a computer game. Oh, okay. Why, why a computer game? Well, you know, get in there. I said, play. So no. Computer game. Yeah, okay, fine. He says, right, okay, good, fine. So we've got the computer game. And the phone rings again. Uh, we're doing a launch night. Oh, yeah, okay, we're launching the festival. All right, okay, yeah. So we need, would you like to be involved in the launch night? When was this, sorry? Can I just... This was last year. Yeah. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah. We'll do the launch, I suppose, yeah, okay. Well, if you're going to do the launch, why won't you play live? <laughs> so he said, okay, we'll play live. But there's a problem. Because we swore, swore to Gary Newman we would never play live again. So we went back and had a look at the piece of paper. And it actually says that Adelaide will be the last gig ever. Technicality. Technicality. So I said, right, okay, we'll do it. One more time. One more fucking time. And that's it. And we keep saying that. And people say, you come back more times than Johnny Farnham. I say, there's always somebody out there who was good to us, and we have to be good to them. Why did you promise to Gary Newman that you would never play live again? Because he happened to be around at the time. (laughs) Because it's funny. It's funny. To get get a piece of paper with Gary Newman written on it saying, we're never going to play live again. And it was mainly his crew. I mean, it was mainly the crew that we said, we, know, we said that, oh, this is our last gig. And so they were extra nice to us and bought us some chocolates and stuff. And we said, we're playing. We, you can't, you can't. And it was a guilt trip, you know. So what are you doing at the Adelaide Festival then? The problem is, how do you do anything that is in any way representative of all of the stuff that we've been talking about? And you can't. If you don't do something experimental, they're disappointed. If you don't play Dead Eyes Open, they're disappointed. If you do something which is too big or too small, there is no way of actually satisfying it all. When we played Sydney Festival, when we played in Belgium recently, it was all about putting on a show. You know, here's all the tracks that you, you want with the video screens and blah 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 now Adelaide is a bit of a floating target at the moment because I got one instruction from the uh, curator one 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 message from David Sefton he says make an old man happy and make sure that you play goodbye tonsils so I said okay yeah. so goodbye tonsils is in the set somewhere right okay good um, I actually had the set worked out and uh, we were about to do it, and then the ABC got involved, and the ABC said, we want to video record the gig. We want to be there, and we're going to broadcast it. So who owns the music? 
and it was like, uh, well, I own most of it, but there's some tracks that are owned by EMI. So we had to then get through the business of how many tracks from old tracks owned by EMI are you going to play? Because the ABC's got to pay EMI, blah, blah, blah. It gets complicated. So you have a big mixture across the 30 years. you got some old shit. you got some new shit. But myself and Stuart Lawler, who is the person I'm working with now, um, we're thinking, how do we do the tape recordery thing? Can we do the tape recordery thing? Is there a way of bringing that tumult back into it? Can we, in some way, cause it to fuck up gloriously? And one of the things we've been playing with is is actually these iPad, the, the iPad software that's coming out now, which is all about scraping and pushing and. And it, there's a lot of tape recordery stuff going on with that. And so we're kind of playing with maybe having lots of iPads and making a big racket with them. But we don't exactly know. We'll, 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 we'll have to... F We've got half an idea. So we know the set. We know what we're trying to achieve. But there's still all kinds of things that can go horribly wrong. And how is Adam TM going to be involved in this? Are you familiar with his previous work or? oh yeah yeah well 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 Yui's he's he's like he's a trooper from from way back um I met Yui a long time ago and 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 flummoxed him with a story about um something which I can't even say on on air but uh Yui he, he, he's a, a good soul you know and so he's another one of these people that we really don't have all that much in common with but but we certainly have the same kind of kindred prankster kind of spirit, which he unleashed with the coconut thing. I mean, just that's just great prank, absolutely. But he's not here to do the prank, though. He's to do his own thing. And so when David Sefton was thinking, well, who else would you would you like to put on? Who else do you think you'd like to play with? Um, would you like to play with, 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 with Yui? I said, yeah, it'd be great. That, that sounds like a really good match. That sounds like, it sounds like no one's going to take the night too seriously. If, if it had been us and Laurie Anderson or something, they'd be shocking. But, you know, you know what I mean? Okay, so, so Yui and I, we're both, we're both kind of got that, that uh, you know, call an ambulance kind of aspect. So, so that, that, that's good. And, and we, we, we haven't had much dealings with him. But we're, we're kind of, you know, I, I've had a bit of an email back and forward and, and you know, we're, we're kind of cool with the whole thing. That'll be really interesting. Well, I, I, think it's a, I think it's a really, as I said, forward-thinking collaboration, I think. Well, we're both, we're both kind of, uh, <laughs> we're both a bit of a, we both know how to have, have a joke. Look, that, that's, that's, that's just so fucking important, I'm so, particularly at these festivals, you know, seriously. For all the people who take it a little bit too seriously. But when you take things too seriously, it causes inertia, it causes sta stasis. And, and, and this is why I don't like the whole art aspect of it, because art is all about locking yourself into an identity. And one thing you've obviously seen here is this constant avoidance of being locked into an identity and so you want to make sure that you never allow it to come out because then it might become high art you know I definitely appreciate that um, and I guess you're also working on something for the Adelaide Festival um, called Hauntology Hon it's called HH Okay. Well, when I was trying to sell it to them, I called it Hauntology House and the sales pitch, but it's kind of grown more than that. It's, it's, it's a music toy. It's a, you go online or you download the game, you get in there, and for, there are many, many things in there, but there is a room in there full of tape recorders. Many tape recorders, and they've all got tape on them that you can start and stop and some of them on trolleys and you can push the trolleys around up and down ramps you can push all the tape recorders in a row there are record players there's scratched records there are all kinds of toys um, there's a backstory to it if you like that if you don't like the backstory that doesn't matter but it is like a great big fun park full of sound and um, I've 
first said I wanted to do this, the first written record I have of this is from 1991. And it's 2013. <laughs> and I have been trying to do this now for a long time. And finally, I said to Sefton, I want to make a computer game. And he says, OK. And in that one exchange, suddenly, I actually had to do it. And it's fucking frightening. And it's driving. And I am in crunch time. I'm in the crunch time at the moment where the game has been, you know, it's, it's been built. It's like, it is the most intense thing ever, programming this thing. It's out of fucking control. If you go to my own website, you can see pictures of it. What's the website? Well, if you go to sevcom.com, there's a log of, of the game and the progress log about how it's going, or tomellard.com. Both of these places will take you to it. But the problem is, once you've done an album, first album, fantastic, second album, great, third album, wonderful, fourth album, okay, fifth album, uh, sixth album, blah, seventh album, there. Twelfth album, give me a fucking break, right? Computer game. Oh, okay, like it's up again. Plus, all the shit that we used to do when we first started, the tape recorders and stuff. But it's all on the computer, so it's modern and it's old. It's it builds that bridge, encapsulates the whole thing. Well, I mean, it's good that you've still got, I guess, a creative outlet that's still kind of dynamic and keeping your attention I guess if you're not absolutely terrified of what you're doing you're not really working and when you first started making electronic music that's the thing that, that gets me when when you first started making electronic music where the equipment would hardly work where you get beaten up where the PA guy would say you're not putting that shit through my PA mate all of that the difficulty of cutting editing tape to make rhythms and stuff that's all gone and if it's not difficult, then you're cruising. And if you're cruising, you're probably not. You're not. You're not working hard enough. You know. I guess this game and on that philosophy, it's a good note to end on. Um, what? What? If I should kill myself. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely don't do that. I'm not encouraging that at all. No. But um, I think that it's a nice note in that it shows that Severed Heads, the project, is not restricted to music and if anything is a project outside of... Moved on. It's moved on and it's, no. it's, it's an organic thing that defies but it's also where categorization. It's, it's, it's where the underground is now. If you know, People are so fucking fascinated with 79 and 80. Oh, where were, where were the bands? Where, and that's going on with the computer game scene now. You know, that's that's the indie game scene is where all the interesting people are these days. Forget musicians. Musicians are boring. Indie game culture is where all the, the cool shit's going on. And that's where I want to be. And when people say to me, you know, seriously, half the email I get is Dead Eyes Open, Dead Eyes Open, you know, 1980 this, 1980 that. I don't even respond anymore because these people don't understand they don't understand that you've got to keep moving you've got to keep evolving and that's where we've got to be you know